Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Rostambash. Uh, first, I want to thank KRG representative and all who arranged this conference. Secondly, I thank you for the opportunity to speak about this important topic today. Although all Iraqis suffered much under the toppled regime, I have to concentrate today only on the uh, case of Kurdish genocide, which is the topic of the conference. Life under Saddam, or more appropriately, death under Saddam, being killed was what everyone thought of under that regime. I will not to speak today as a member of Iraqi parliament or as a politician, but as a victim of the regime and a witness of the genocide. Before I start, I would like to welcome and salute the representatives of the people who were subjected also to genocide. Your presence here today is very important for working together to prevent genocide and crimes against humanity from taking place anywhere in the world. I personally had a few encounters with Saddam killing machine as a Kurd, as a physician, and as a political opponent. As a Kurd, in February 1988, I was with a group of Peshmergas in the area of Bargalu. This planes, his planes dropped few nitrogen mustard and sarin nerve gas bombs on the village near us. Dozens of people were injured and killed. Our masks were primitive. The filter was a wet cloth and charcoal only. I tried to help the brave doctors who, to save as many lives as possible, but it was not easy at all. Those who were exposed to nitrogen mustard gas had their skins burned and later suffocated. Others who were exposed to the sarin nerve gas were hysterically laughing or crying, banging their heads against the walls before they died in front of us. A few days later, we left the area and started a long journey by foot to the Iranian borders. On the evening of that day, we stayed at the Peshmerga tent camp. A dozen of us slept in one tent that night. The procedure was to try and seal the tent, and seal the tent, light a stove inside it, and wear our primitive gas masks while sleeping. At night, we heard a thump, and we realized it was another chemical attack. But we couldn't do anything. All we did was to run and take a higher position than that of the shelled area. We found later that the bombs had directly hit two tents near us, and over 20 people instantly died. Again, the gas used was a cocktail of mustard, uh, sarin, and other nerve gases. We continued our journey to Iran. The next night, we stayed in a village in Mawat area to the north of Suleimania. Soon after we left the village, in the morning, Iraqi army artillery and planes shelled it with the same chemicals and killed and injured dozens of civilians and Peshmergas. All of this was only part of the second phase of the unfiled campaigns, which were eight. As a political opponent, I along, with, uh, I, along with 12 others, was poisoned by thallium on the 24th of November, 1987. Ironically, it was Thanksgiving Day in the United States. For those of you who don't know, thallium is a rat poison. It was sealed in our yogurt drink. Two men and a man died the same day. Some of the others received treatment in the UK and Europe. 
Here I must thank Amnesty International for facilitating the treatment of the victims in the UK. As for me, I had to undergo a six month long treatment in Kurdistan to recover from the effects of the poisoning. The medication was smuggled to me secretly from Baghdad and some was sent from people who were receiving the treatment in Europe. The other time I faced Saddam's death machine was in 1971, September 1971, when I was with the late General Barzani and the regime tried to assassinate him through explosive detonated in the room where we were receiving a religious delegation. I was sitting in the same room with General Barzani. We both survived, fortunately, explosion that killed and wounded a lot of people there. This happened at a time we had a peace treaty with Baghdad and had ministers in the central government. This is just part of my story. Almost every Kurd and every Iraqi has a story to tell about Saddam's brutality. But there are hundreds of thousands of others untold stories. The regime's brutality and killing reached, reached them before being able to speak and tell you what happened. In Kurdistan, Saddam's smell of death was embodied in the Amphal genocide campaign. Using chemical weapons, his plan was to eradicate all forms of life in the Kurdish area through his scorched earth policy. He was planning to transfer the entire Kurdish population to the south, exactly like what Stalin did to the population of Chechnya after the Second World War. This genocide campaign was interrupted by Iraq-Iran war and later stopped by his invasion of Kuwait. By then, over 400,000 villages were destroyed and more than 182,000 people were taken to the southern deserts and buried alive in mass graves. To this day, we are trying to find these graves. We have found some but many more are still unknown. I will not get into details of the atrocities as I am sure that you will hear very informative speeches and information about what exactly happened during those days later today and already the minister said a lot of very important informations. Telling the story of Kurdish genocide will not be complete without mentioning the silence of the international community when Saddam was committing these atrocities. But at the same time, the international Western media, the NGOs, and many members of parliaments of the silent countries or states were very supportive of the plight of the victims of Kurdish genocide. I convey to them and those who are with us here today the gratitude of the people of Kurdistan. We will never forget what you did for us. And I want to mention specifically our friend Gwen Roberts, who is present here today. He followed the chemical attacks. Then after 10 years, he went again and followed it. And I think he will speak and show him today. I'm glad for that. Also, I heard that Mr. Kushner was on his way here. I think he was from the 70s following these things, at least the, what happened to the Kurds. We will never forget also what Madame Mitterrand did to help the Kurds also. At the time, the turning of a blind eye, and also I want to thank uh, the IPP, the all-party uh, parliament, uh, a group in Parliament for the UK. They have been always helping our case. I want to thank them also here. I want to thank all of you. I cannot mention all the names, but I want to thank all of you. I'm sure all of you have helped our people and will go, uh, are going to help again. At the time of turning a blind eye on Saddam and the neglect of the victims was happening in both camps, East and West. 
This emboldened the regime and made them very confident about their crimes and free to continue them. In 1991, when we were negotiating a possible settlement with the regime, I asked Ali Hassan Majid, known as Ali Chemical, about the fate of 182,000 people who were taken in the Amphal campaigns. His angry response was that I shouldn't exaggerate because the number is not even 100,000. At the time of Halabcha and during the Amphal campaigns, I was a member of the leadership of the Kurdistan Front, an umbrella group that had all the political parties of Iraqi Kurdistan. During that period, I experienced firsthand the international silence and support for Saddam that bordered criminality. The material that he used to make his chemical weapons in the Muthanna factory in Baghdad kept coming in agriculture, as agricultural fertilizers and pesticides from the various countries. And their companies, despite the fact that Halabja and Amphal had taken, have taken place. Right after Halabja massacre, the US State Department released a statement saying that Iran is the one who gassed the city and not Iraq. The regime represented by the then foreign minister, Tariq Aziz, used this statement to defend themselves. From December 1988 to January 1989, I was in Washington representing a city that was entirely gassed by chemical weapons. I was representing 182,000 people who were put in mass graves in southern deserts. For a whole month, I was trying to meet somebody from State Department on behalf of Kurdistan Front to tell them the story of the Kurds. Nobody was willing to see me even the human rights section of the State Department refused to meet me. When I insisted on meeting somebody, the officer of the Iraq desk told me over the phone that they couldn't see me because they didn't want to re jeopardize their very good relations with Iraq. At the same time, in January 1989, a world summit was held in Paris against the use of chemical weapons. The, ref the conference was organized after Halabja, the living embodiment of the use of chemical weapons. But no one from Halabja or any other part of Gaz Kurdistan was allowed to attend or speak at the conference, despite the fact that hundreds of Kurds were standing outside the building. The resolutions of the conference didn't contain a single word about Saddam or Iraq or the Kurds. The Soviet Union and the East Camp were no better. Their state media constantly defended the regime and never spoke about the crimes of Amphal and Halabja. Their diplomats throughout the world did the same. Some of their companies and scientists also helped the regime in his crimes. In 1988, and during annual, the annual meeting of the UN General Assembly, a delegation of Arab states, representatives in the UN, led by the Kuwaiti representative, met with the UN Secretary General, Javier Perez de Cuellar, and told him that Iraq didn't use many chemical weapons. Today, Saddam regime is toppled. The new Iraq fortunately recognized what happened as a genocide. But Halabcha and other remains and other areas remain an open wound of Kurdistan, the healing of which may take forever. Until this day, figures of infant mortality, birth deformity, cancer, and many other diseases are higher in Halabcha and 20 other places that were gassed than any other place in Kurdistan or in the Middle East. The international community should shoulder the responsibility of consequences of their malicious silence and support for Saddam genocide. While we thank the Swedish and Norwegian parliaments, 
For their positive stance on this issue, we think there is a greater need that the international community, especially the countries that were silent at the time, to recognize what happened as genocide. The victims are also in need of knowing exactly the long-term health implications of chemical weapons. Research establishing the link between chemical weapons and today's diseases should be funded. It is an, it is, this is in addition to the treatment of victims and their compensation who are still suffering and are being born. Governments and companies who supplied Saddam with chemical and helped him should account for their actions. I think the international community, the international community should recognize the, what happened to the Kurds as genocide. The international recognition of Kurdish genocide is the least that can be done for the victims. Thank you very much for your kind attention.